All right, so I'm just going to get started right now because I had a couple of questions about the whole thing about the claim, reason, evidence, warrant again, and I just wanted to go over that just really briefly again. Uh, if you remember uh, in, the, in the lecture, I guess it was uh, lecture th three, so it was last Friday, we went over claim, reason, evidence, warrant, and I had a bunch of different slides with a bunch of different uh, diagrams, okay, and I'm, I'm a little, I, I regret that I had so many diagrams. I should have just maybe just had one, right? <laughs> and and if, if I just had one, I would have just had the one um, with the arrow going up and the arrow going down. And the point there being is really this is the way I'm understanding, and I think this is, well, I think this is the right way to understand claim, reason, evidence, and warrant uh, in the sense that um, we had the claim and the evidence um, Basically, you, you make a claim, so these are the example that we had of, of uh, the claim was the wind is blowing to the south, and then the evidence is we looking at the wind sock, right? Um, and the reason is really the characteristic of both claim and evidence um, that, that is common to them both, that, that what puts them in the same category, right? And that's why I had the arrow going up from that wind sock evidence up to the reason. The reason is, the reason is there's sort of both blowing, both facing south, right? And that's the, the kind of common characteristics that both the evidence and the claim have, the evidence being the wind sock, the, the claim being the wind, right? Blowing to the south. It's a common characteristic, and that's the reason. Um, the, but with, if you just have a reason, it's, um, what I'm arguing is that it's inadequate. You need to still have a warrant um, that shows um, that the reason really connects um, the evidence to the claim in, an, in a necessary way, that there's a correlation between um, the evidence and the claim. And that's what the warrant does. It's an explanation of that correlation, right? And so the explanation is, you know, when the wind blows, it blows the windsock, and so naturally the windsock will have to be going in the same direction as the wind, right? You, couldn't, you wouldn't have that same warrant if, you know, if you're using a car. You know, the car is pointing to the south, it, it, uh, it doesn't give us an indication of which way the wind is going uh, because we don't have that warrant that tells us, oh, when the wind's blowing a certain way, the car is going to blow that face in that way too, right? So, um, so, so what am I trying to say? So, so I guess, you know, in, in thinking through it, I mean, we've got the claim on the one side and the evidence on the, one on the other side, and we're trying, we need to link the two up, right? Uh, and what I'm saying, there's two ways of doing that. One is through this reason, and the reason does it um, because you realize that, that both the claim and the evidence have this common characteristic. Um, but that's not enough because you still need, you know, just because they, they both are in the same, have the same characteristic doesn't mean that there's any kind of necessary relationship between the two. And the warrant is what gives you that necessary relationship. It explains the connection then uh, between the claim and the evidence um, on the basis of the, of, the, of the reason. All right, I hope that helps a little bit. Okay? Um, yes? So, thinking about this, putting this into the context of a paper, if you have a couple of uh, subclaims in your paper, yes. and your warrants somehow, uh, should it be that your warrants don't contradict one another? Your warrants should not contradict each other, right. So, uh, but if, like, uh, so then, I guess what we're trying to get is what happens, oh, if, you, if you have two warrants that are really good for the, for the claimant, but they somehow contradict one another, how would you settle those? You have to figure out what you believe, I guess, right? Because you got, you have, you have, your warrants have to, to, yeah, they have, they can't contradict each other. You have to, you have to sort of figure out, you know, what's, what, what are your organizing principles for how you're, how you're making your argument. We'll, we're going to go through some more examples today through, with the war burden. So uh, hopefully it'll make it clearer, right? Because we're going to, I'm going to go through very specific examples. Okay, so let's start. Uh, let's start with an easy one. Okay, uh, uh, and I've laid it out just very. Um, elaborately here, right? Um, and in, in some sense, I'm, I'm taking this one off the table for your essay, though you could use this for your essay, but you would have to use your own words. You can't just copy my words, okay? All right, so let's go through this uh, example, right? So he, he says that um, he's got this, another example of how a picture functions on the level of writing in the same way that an action functions on the level of speaking. Right? So, so a, a picture functions 
on the level of writing, the way an action functions on the level of speaking. So remember last time we talked about how actions um, could communicate things, right? Okay? And now he's going to give us this, it's just sort of a mixture between an action and a picture, right? So let's, let's read through this. Now this way of expressing the thoughts by action perfectly coincide with that of recording them by picture. So that's, that's a claim, right? There's a remarkable circumstance in ancient story which participates so equally of the nature of speaking by action and writing by picture. Right? It's, it's sort of a, a, a mixture of both. That we may well consider it as the link by which these two forms of expression are connected and as an argument of their very near relation to one another. Right? He, he, he says this is the reason, this is the argument for the claim. Right? Okay, so then he tells the story. The story is told by Clemens Alexi Alexandrinus. It is said that Idanthura, a king of the Scythians, as Pharisees Sirius relates it, when ready to oppose Darius, who had passed the Ister, sent the Persian a symbol of letters, namely a mouse, a frog, a bird, a dart, and a plow. Thus, this message being to supply both speech and writing, the purport of it was, we see, expressed by a composition of action and picture. Okay, so. Um, so so he, he lays out the scene for us, right? There's this, you know, uh, this guy, Idan Thura, he's king of the Scythians. He sees that the Darius, the Persians are going to come. He's, the Persians, you know, they're, they're kind of the, 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 the superpower back, you know, way back when, right? Um, and they were going to come and invade uh, the Scythians. And Idan Thura, instead of sending him some kind of a message, uh, sends to Darius this package that, incl that includes a mouse, a frog, a bird, a dart, and a plow, right? That's the only thing he sends him as a message, right? Um, and uh, Warburton says, well, this is an example of both action and picture. So it is, right? He, 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 he carries on an action sending this package of, of things, right? And it's also a picture, you know, you, you, you know, he, Darius opens up the package and he sees these things, you know? What is he supposed to think here? Um, and uh, you know, it's kind of, it's a sign, right? It's a sign of, of, of what's going to happen. You've got the choice of the plow piece. You've got the choice of the dart. The dart's going to kill everything flying, running in the, in the water, right? So you better watch out Darius, right? So that's kind of the message, right? Or that's, I'm interpreting the message, yeah? Um, and what here Warburton is saying, he says that these two things, this speaking through action is very closely related to writing with pictures, right? And he says the reason for this, right, is that those two things can happen at the same time, and because they can happen at the same time, as in this example, this is the evidence, um, we can see that they're very closely related, right? So that's enough to make the argument, right? He's made the argument all the way through down to here, right? Um, but then he does actually add this warrant, which kind of tells us how, how do we link up this evidence back to that claim. And he says, I mean, or so, he says that the message being to supply both speech and writing the purpose of what we see expressed by composition of action and picture. So I'm interpreting that, right? I'm saying it's a merging of speech and writing that creates this merging of action and picture, right? So you've got speech and writing together, um, and then there's action and picture together. Right? Um, and so he's, he's saying that a picture functions on the level of writing in the same way that an action functions on the level of speaking. Right? So both of them, so the picture in, in writing has a kind of way of communicating something um, through a kind of illustration. And he's saying that an action, when you're sp in, 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 the, in the level of speaking, the same thing happens with speaking with actions when you, when you, when you do something um, in order to communicate something, right? Uh, and he says that those two are analogous, that they, they function in the same way. And that's the reason that speaking through action is closely related to writing with pictures. Or that's, the, that's, the, um, that's the way you can, you can explain this example as linking the two, um, speaking and writing. Um, actions and pictures, right? So he, he, he already does it already by just saying, there, you know, we can, we can point to this evidence. So he can, he can say that those things are speaking through action is closely related to writing with pictures. He can say that, and then he can point to the evidence, and here's an example of that, right? Reasoning being that um, those things are coinciding in this particular piece of evidence, 
right? And that's essentially enough, right? Um, but then, you know, it, you could say um, that it's just a coincidence. There's no necessary relationship. There's no reason why this example tells us that there's a kind of necessary relationship between um, the speaking and the writing and the, and the action and the picture, right? But this is the, this is, this warrant is the one that tells us that there's that relationship, that, that there's a kind of necessary relationship between the two um, in which he's, he's linking, I mean, he's, he's, he's showing us the way in which um, those relationships all are, are analogous, that, 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 that the action of speaking and the, and the picture in writing, they're, um, they're doing the same thing, they're, they're carrying out that same function, okay? All right, I hope that makes it a little bit clearer. Yeah? Is that warrant like your interpretation? Or this warrant is really kind of my interpretation, but I, I think I'm getting what he's saying here, right? Because he's, I mean, he's saying this, right here he's saying the exact same thing, right? I'm here, I am kind of extrapolating a little bit, uh, which is to say, I think he has to believe this in order to say that, right? And so, so it's true that the warrant is not always stated explicitly in the text. Right? You have to kind of add it sometimes, or because it's, it's often it's an assumption that the writer is making about what's going on. Okay. Um, all right, we're going to move on because this is tricky. Okay. Um, the first interpretation that we have then uh, of this main issue in the text is this interpretation of these brambles. So um, he's got he goes into this whole long commentary about um, this particular story that he tells, right? Um, and this is sort of the, what kind of takes up the entire second section of the text that you've read. Um, and the point of it is to show um, that speaking by action later than develops into uh, apologue and fable. An apologue is a, is a kind of fable with a clear moral to it. Right? So it's apologue is really just like, kind of like a, a, a fable, right? <laughs> um, and he says here, um, so I'll, I'll read this. Through. Okay, this is, this is the sort of the main argument that he's making. As speech became more cultivated, this rude manner of speaking by action was smoothed and polished into an apologue or fable, where the speaker, to enforce his purpose by a suitable impression, told a familiar tale of his own invention, composed with some cir such circumstances and made his design evident and persuasive. Right, so he's telling, he's going to tell a story in order to uh, make his point. For language was yet too narrow and the minds of men too undisciplined to support only abstract reasoning and a direct address. Right, and so the reason that people used these apologues or fables was because um, at one point language was not um, developed enough, the minds of men were not developed enough to be able to just use abstract reasoning and sort of a direct statement. You needed to use this sort of figurative speech in order to communicate. And then we have a noble example of this form of instruction in the speech of Jotham to the men of Sechem, um, in which he upbraids their folly and for, oh, tells their ruin in, choos in choosing Abilene for their king. So um, we have claim, reason, and evidence, right? The warrant here is missing, okay? And we're gonna, actually the, the warrant is gonna be the topic of our whole hour today, right, because it's, he goes through actually the, all of these things in order to finally get to the warrant at the end, okay? So we're going to just hold off on the question of the warrant here. But uh, what, what I, what I want to focus on here is that um, he's bringing this example, and he actually gives us several different ways of reading the example. So you remember the example of this, uh, of this story he had, right? He had the story uh, of these different trees that needed to choose a king, right? Um, and, and the problem was, you know, the olive tree didn't want to be the king, the fig tree didn't want to be the king, um, the vine didn't want to be the king, because they had all these good reasons just to, you know, to do their own thing. They were quite happy with what they were doing. And it was finally, they asked the brambles to become the king, and the brambles said, oh yes, I'll become king. Um, and, um, and what the first interpretation or the, I guess the second interpretation, so the first interpretation he started here and he, he didn't finish, so we're going we're to get back to that in, later on. 
But this is the second interpretation. This, this he has in the footnote. So he's, he's, before he even gives us this whole story, he has a footnote. Right? He has this very long footnote. Right? Uh, and remember, the long footnotes are really important for him. Right? So uh, in the footnote, he says <coughs> that the general moral of this story about the trees and the brambles is that, uh, which is of infinite importance, and inculcated with all imaginable forces that weak and worthless men are ever foremost in thrusting themselves into power. Right? That's the moral of the story. Right? Um, and the reason he gives for that right, was, was actually before. In the, in the previous slide, it was like in the, in the main text, and this was in the footnote. Right? Uh, so you have to, so sometimes you have to piece these th the claim, reason, evidence, and work together out of different pieces of the text. Right? And so there's an example of that. And the reason in, in which he upbraids their folly, he's, you know, when, he's, when he's speaking to them, and foretells their ruin in choosing Abimelech for their king, because Abimelech was a horrible king, right? He was, he was like, he was, you never want him to be king, right? It's kind of like having the brambles being the king of, um, of the trees, right? And he says, um, this is why you don't want the brambles, right? So here he, he has, I'll just quote this part where he talks about the brambles. He says, then all the trees unto the bramble, then said all the trees unto the realm, come thou and reign over us, and the bramble said unto the trees, if in truth you anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow, and if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Okay? And you know, wh what's wrong with that? Right? It's like, oh, there's, you know, the bramble is saying all this stuff. And Warburton explains to us what's wrong with this statement. Right? And he says, okay, the vanity of base men in power is taught in the 15th verse. That's the 15th verse. And the ridicule of that vanity is inimitably marked out in those circumstances, where the bramble is made to bid his new subjects, who wanted no shadow, to come and put their trust in his, who had none, and that in case of disobedience he would send out from himself a fire that should devour the cedars of Lebanon, when as the fire of brambles and such like weeds was short and momentary even to a proverb amongst the Easterns." Right? So he's saying that when he's describing, you know, when in, the, in the fable or in this epilogue, when they're describing the brambles, they're describing the way the brambles are, you know, uh, in accepting to become king, are boasting of something they can't really do. They say, well, uh, he's telling the, the other trees, come and, you know, you know, rest in my shadow. The brambles have hardly any shadow. Uh, certainly a tree couldn't rest in the shadow of the brambles, right? And so, uh, and then, um, the, the brambles are also claiming, well, if you don't obey me, um, then I am going to set fire to you, right? Except that the problem is that the fire of the brambles are like weeds. They're very short and momentary. They're never going to burn down the trees, right? And so the, the brambles are sort of claiming all of this power, even though they have no power, and they, 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 they don't have that ability to become king. And so that's how he's explaining, right? This is the warrant um, that explains how this quote um, demonstrates to us um, that this whole fable is being told in order to uh, explain to ha us how uh, these weak and worthless men are the ones um, that want to become king. Right? So um, I think that kind of makes sense, right? Because what we're, what we, you, he's got he's that, that claim, he's pointing to the evidence. The evidence is, you know, it's not so clear, right? You, you read that phrase and you're, you're kind of wondering, well, what does that have to do with kings and, you know, um, kingdoms and ruling, and then he gives us the explanation, and it's the explanation that, that links back to the reason, right? Because the reason here is about the kings, right? About how um, uh, choosing Abimelech for the king was, was a bad idea, right? Um, so we've got the claim, the reason, evidence, and the warrant is really what, it's, you know, it's what's missing here, that you wouldn't really understand what's going on unless you got the warrant, right? Even though you could take it on faith without the warrant, in a sense. Right? You can just say, oh yeah, he's reading the evidence uh, in the right way. But it, you, know, if you kind of want to have the explanation. By, by reading the evidence for yourself, you want to be able to sort of follow his line of, uh, of, line of reasoning. And that's what he's doing with the warrant. So anyway, that's his, that's his second interpretation of Brambles that kind of gives us an understanding of just what's going on in this fable uh, and why it's an apologue that has a moral and what the moral is. Then he gives us another example. Um, and this is an example of this third interpretation of the brambles um, that's imputed um, to this Mr. Collins. And Mr. Collins, according to Warburton, is kind of, kind of stupid. He doesn't really know what's going on, 
right? Um, and he's showing this through this uh, argument that he reproduces from, from Mr. Collins. Mr. This, this is basically you know, his description of what Mr. Collins says, right? And the key here is that the, 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 the claim that Collins has is that the ancients th thought not only that beasts, but that trees spoke in the first ages of the world. Well, actually, Collins actually says that, um, that, that um, the reason that the, the, the beasts, no, no, wait a minute, the reason that we have all these beasts speaking in, in the Bible is because back then people thought that beasts could actually speak, right? Um, and so, um, Warburton, and, and, and he uses as evidence, you know, this example um, in the Bible um, where, you know, there's the, the, there's the fall in Eden where the, um, the, the snake talks to Eve and tells her you need, you need to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Uh, and so, in that example, the snake is speaking, right? And, and, and Collins says, oh yeah, see, that's an example of how these people used to think that animals could speak, right? And so that was the argument. And, and so, and, and Warburton says, well, you know, if, if that's an example of, that, that tells us that people back then thought that animals could speak, then this other example, when the brambles are speaking, that must be also an example of how not only the beast, but also that trees spoke in the first age of the world, that, that those people must have believed that trees also spoke. Right? So he's kind of making fun of Collins right, at this point. Right? You know, he's like saying, well, if he believes that based on that evidence, then he must also believe that the trees could speak based on this other evidence that's very similar. <coughs> right? um, so, so he's reproducing Collins' argument. The claim is here. Right? The reason, right, so he, he, trees in the Bible, I mean, it's, it's not laid out in this text, but you kind of have to add it. Trees in the Bible speak, right? or beasts in the Bible speak. Though that would be the reason for why you would believe that people back then thought that beasts and trees could speak, right? And the evidence is, well, so this is it's basically the same evidence, right? So we've got, then said all the trees unto the bramble, right? The trees are speaking, right? And so if um, that's the evidence, what's the warrant here, right? Why would you, you know, why would you then believe um, that this example when trees are speaking would lead you to the claim that people back then thought that trees could speak. The warrant is, by Jonathan Smith, told after a simple historical manner like all the relations of the Old Testament, right? Um, or you could say maybe so plainly and simply exposed. Basically he's saying that when you read something you have to read it um, in a simple historical manner. That you can't read it as metaphorical. You can't read it as a kind of figure of speech. You have to read it straight. You have to lead, read things totally literally, right? And if we read things, everything literally in the Bible, then that's what you get. You get trees could speak. Animals could speak. And so that's why those pe we know that those people believe that, right? So that's the, the argument that we get from Mr. Collins, or that, that Warburton is reproducing us from Mr. Collins, and it, it all fits. Um, into this whole, I mean, the, all, we've got all the pieces. We've got the claim, the reason, the evidence, and the warrant. The key, though, is the warrant, right? Is, do you believe that we have to take everything in the Bible literally, right? And if you believe that, then everything else follows. Warburton then sort of explains, well, this is a silly way, obviously a silly way of doing this. This is the right way. Right? So then he, he gives us, this is the way we need to, to, to interpret um, th this, this issue of speech in the Bible. And so he says, um, they delighted in fabulous traditions, but what then? They had always the sense to give a sufficient cause to every effect. So he's talking about the ancients who, you know, who wrote the Bible. Right? They never represented things out of nature, but as placed there by some god who had nature in his power. So he's saying, okay, you can't just look at nature as just nature itself. You have to see nature as something that God created, and God created with this power of God. And then he gives us another example. Even Homer, the father of fables, when he makes the horse of Achilles speak, or feel human passions, thinks it not enough to represent them as stimulated by God without informing us that they were of celestial and immortal race likewise. So he's, he's giving us this 
Second example of, a, of, an, of an animal that speaks, and this is, a, you know, this is the horses of Achilles who, who speak right, in, uh, in, the, in, the Odyssey, uh, in the Iliad, right? Um, and he's saying this is another, another example, right? But we have to interpret this example in a different way. So he's got this evidence that he's saying is analogous to the evidence he's, we've got here about the, the speaking trees, right? Um, and he's going to tell us how to interpret it, right? Because he says, well, you know, if the claim is that um, the, the ancients had a sufficient cause for every effect, so the effect was these animals speaking, the cause, he's saying that the reason is that um, God placed this power into them, right? Um, the evidence is this other, you know, both of these passages essentially where these animals are speaking, um, and in which Homer clearly states that these, these, um, these, these horses were stimulated by God. They, in fact, the, the, the horse themselves um, had a kind of um, immortal pedigree, right? That they, were, they weren't regular horses. They were kind of like immortal, magical horses, right? Um, and so the warrant here is that the ancient love of prodigy and wonder had never shown itself in these effects, but for the certain tradition of God's frequent display of his extraordinary providence in the first ages of the world. So if, if there is some kind of, if there's an, an animal speaking, um, it must be due to somehow the power and influence of God that would have created this situation. Or, um, I, mean, the, I mean, the other argument he was making before was how um, the, the examples of images were used sort of as a, as a kind of um, more powerful way of speaking, right? That, that, would, um, uh, that would convince people better than a, a kind of literal statement of what's going on. Right? And so, but, but in a sense, you know, the warrant he's using is that we can't look at this text as a kind of literal historical text. We have to look at this text as something that's kind of suffused by the power of God, in a sense. Right? Um, and that suffusing by the power of God could have led to something where an animal was speaking sort of in, a, in an exceptional, miraculous situation. Right? Um, or it's something in which w it's an example of how these images speak to us um, in a way that's not literal, right? Um, he, he goes on, you know, he actually, you know, I'm, I'm not going to uh, lay it all out, but he goes on and he, he actually um, explains, he gives another explanation for this, this um, uh, phenomenon of animals speaking. And he, and, and he goes through and he kind of gives these examples of how um, people in the past often look to animals in order to give them signs of what's going on. So um, um, there's one passage, it was actually in French, but uh, what it said was that there's, you know, there, there's some, uh, who was it that he was talking about? I, I forget now. Uh, anyway, he was talking about some, uh, some peoples in the past who, when they saw birds, and the birds did a certain thing, it was clear that the birds saw other people somewhere else. Right? And, th and that they had a habit of sort of, um, you know, flying in a particular way when they saw other people. And so that was a sign to the people looking at the birds, oh, there must be another group of people somewhere. Right? And so that was the way in which the animals spoke to them. But it was not really um, kind of like this example of the trees speaking out loud, but really a way in which when you look at animals and their behavior, you can, um, you can deduce something that's going on in the world, right? So, you know, so, so Warburton also gives us this other kind of example about how animals speak, right? But, but in any case, he's, he's separating very carefully a kind of literal historical account from um, a kind, yeah, uh, uh, an account using figures of speech and account, an account that takes into consideration the power of God in the world, right? So, so those are the, the, the two kinds of warrants that he's using. Um, so maybe we'll pause for questions here.